Hey, this is Monica Rangel, financial services professional with Efficient Financial and Insurance Solutions. And if you want to learn the six and seven figure science to success, significantly increase your revenue and learn how to successfully build professional relationships, you should be listening to the Sell Without Selling podcast with my good friend, Stacey Oburn. If you're ready to get out of your own way to follow the seven-figure science of success, then welcome to Sell Without Selling. Tune in with renowned international speaker Stacey O'Byrne as she shows you how mastering relationships, achieving the proper mindset, and attaining the necessary motivation will catapult you away from failure and onto your journey to greatness. And now, here is your host, Stacey O'Byrne. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Sell Without Selling. I'm your host, Stacey O'Byrne, and I believe that learning the art and the science of how to sell without selling is the only way to achieve high six and seven figure success. I'm really excited to get into today's episode. And really quick, if you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or sales professional, and you haven't hit the level of success that you've wanted or needed, or if you're stuck and needing a pivot in your business and your success, or maybe you just want more and you understand the importance of having a coach to help identify the blind spots, increase accountability, and help with success strategies to take you, your business, your income, and your success to the next level. If this sounds like something for you, then head over to pivotpointadvantage.com slash I want success. That's pivotpointadvantage.com slash I want success. There's a quick application there that will lead to a personal phone call with me to see if we're a great fit for each other. All right, let's do this. Today I'm speaking with a really long time good friend of mine, Monica Rangel. Monica, often described as a woman on the go, she is a great resource to her community. If you need something done, she often knows who can help get it done. She's a master networker in her own right, something we both have in common. As a successful financial professional for the last 14 years, she has gotten to know many aspects of her business. She provides financial planning services in the area of retirement planning, college funding, estate planning, buy-sell agreements, executive bonus plans, deferred compensation, 401k rollovers to IRAs, long-term care planning, and income protection planning with use of life insurance. Monica grew up in Anaheim, a graduate of California State University Fullerton, where she received her Bachelor's of Arts degree in communication with a minor in business administration. I am so excited for you to hear my conversation today with Monica. Monica, welcome to the show. Thank you, Stacey. It's so glad. I'm so happy to see you and it's, I'm so happy to see you succeed. I met you <laughs> such a long time ago and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be part of your journey of growth. You know what, I got to tell you, when when you and I met at, uh, it was a training event, when you and I met in an event, I just connected with you, and we've kind of been connected ever since. I've watched you through your two kids' births, and and now I'm watching you develop your little mini me, or your little mini you, I guess I should say. <laughs> yes, it's a lot of fun. It's a, a great, it's been a great experience, uh, definitely motherhood, and growing a business at the same time, and knowing that both are possible and that you could be successful both being a mother and a business owner. It's been a great journey. It definitely has its highs and lows, but it's it's been a wonderful experience so far. Yeah. You know, um, it, I, I'm really happy you brought that point up because that's definitely something I, I want to get into in, in a little bit. And that's that's the, the the scheduling of you know a very successful businesswoman, along with raising two very incredible kids who are both in school. And you know because of the pandemic, because of COVID, you managing their their schedules and and their education, and as well as your business, your growth, and your team. It's all it's all very taxing. And before we go down that conversation. I'd like to really get a foundation for our listeners as to who you are and the journey you've taken to get to where you're at. So when did you decide you wanted to be in financial planning? 
um, I decided that, well, I, when I was a little girl, I always wanted to be a business owner. I always saw myself as a business person. Um, I used to watch Punky Brewster <laughs> when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And there was an episode of some kind that she was in New York and she was dressed up in this little black dress with pearls. And she went to her rich friend's house in a limousine. And then I said, oh, that's what I want. I want to be in New York in a limousine with a black dress and pearls and having a fancy dinner. Um, and that's really where, um, but I always really wanted to be a business person. And I think that stemmed from, you know, my mom, we're immigrants. We came from, I was born in Mexicali, in Mexico. I came when I was eight years old. My mom was a single mom with two kids at the time. And my mom sold everything. She sold Tupperware. She sold Mary Kay. She worked three jobs. I'm almost four jobs um, at a time just to make sure that we were provided for. So mm -hmm. I always learned grit and I learned uh, perseverance and not to be afraid uh, or to, to be fearless and take chances. And that's where I really got that from my mom growing up. And so um, I went into a career in nonprofit right after college. And that was a great experience and I treated it like my business. Uh, but then I realized that there was a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of growth potential when you have an employer. And um, so I was watching Oprah, which, you know, we all love Oprah. And mm -hmm. there was an episode on Oprah and, and she, she said, you know, what are some careers that don't have glass ceilings for women? And at the time, you know, was uh, recruiting. I did a, a test at Cal State Fullerton through their career uh, department. And I said, you know, the career personality types of the careers that I would be good for would be like recruiting or fi um, financial insurance. Mm -hmm. But insurance has a huge gamut. You know, you could do car insurance, commercial insurance, life insurance, financial planning. So um, I did my research and I really love connecting with people and I love relationships. I, I treasure my relationships for a long time. And I feel, I love, you know, being a essential part of somebody's life. So I'm not a transactional person. And so that's how financial services and um, life insurance and financial planning became the, the focus because that's where you can really build a long-term relationship with somebody and be really making impact in their life on a, on a long-term basis. And so that's how, um, that's how it fit. It just, it was my calling. I, I really feel that what I do is my calling because I am an essential part of somebody's life in the good times when, you know, they win the lottery, hopefully, um, or when their business sells and, and they take or they take their company public and they have all this money or in the bad times when, you know, mom and dad get sick and they have to take care of them and we have to come up with a strategy for that. Or, you know, the, somebody passes away, husband passes away and we got to make sure. So like you're with people in the good and in the bad. And that relationship um, is really, you know, why I love the work. Nice. So did you go straight from the nonprofit straight to financial advising? Oh, wow. Yeah, so you I did. Early. And, you jumped you quick. Know, yeah. And the reason I did that is because when I was in nonprofit, I was helping people, you know, I was mm -hmm. being of service and really, you know, wanting to make a difference in their life. And that same attitude and same belief system transferred so well into financial advising because you're there to be of service. You want to listen to them. What is their, what's important to them? What, what do they want their future to look like? And then my job is just to create a strategy using the financial tools that I have available that I know how to use to help them get to that goal. And so that's that. So I think that's why it was such a smooth transition for me because, you know, some people think finance and they think numbers, but really finance is, is, is understanding and listening and having like deep conversations with people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that, that leads me to a couple of things you brought up, grit, perseverance, fearlessness, and, and taking chances. So, so talk to me about, about the grit aspect that, that you learned from your mother. What, what did that look like? What, what did that feel like? How do you apply that today in your business? And in the past during your journey to, to accomplish the success you have? Yeah, so definitely it's been a gritty 15 year, almost 15 years. Yeah. Um, you know, I started, I was very young. I was in my early twenties and, you know, I think I spent most of my mid twenties trying to look 40. And now that I'm 40, I'm in my forties, I'm trying to look 25 again. <laughs> But I realized that, you know, when I was in my mid twenties, I wanted to look 40 because I thought, you know, people are not going to take me serious, giving them retirement planning advice. 
when I'm like a kid, you know, and now that I'm in my 40s, I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to look 25 because now I have more credibility. I've been doing this for so long. Mm -hmm. But the um, the reality of it is that, you know, you just have to get a lot of no's. And there's a lot of, I mean, every day I still get no's, but I just know that it's just part of the process. And it's not personal when people, you know, they ghost you, right? They don't call you back or or they, um, they change their mind or, you know, now I'm dealing with, you know, oh, I could Robin Hood or, you know, whatever uh, online and uh, online app, or they could go online and do it themselves, you know, they, so then that, per, you know, those perceptions of people and the things that the different challenges that have come up in the last 15 years before, you know, was real estate. Oh, why am I going to do this if I can just buy real estate or why can I do this? And that. so the objections are, there's, they're always, there's always objections of why yeah. people aren't doing the things that they, they should be doing or that I think they should be doing, but I don't take it personal. A lot of times when people, you know, say no or ghost me, which is happens to everybody in sales, um, it has nothing to do with me and it just has to do with them and their mindset and where they're at in their life at that point. And years later, they'll come back. And because I've been doing this for so long, people have come back and they said, you know, that time that you called me, you know, I was having trouble with my business partner. I wasn't about to start planning my future about retirement with them because I didn't know if I was going to stay in that business or the bit, you know, or if it's a husband and wife, you know, they didn't know if that relationship was going to work out. So why were they going to plan something for, you know, 15 years from now or 20 years from now when they didn't know what was going on right now? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, you know, they do eventually come back. Um, and so you just have to have patience and perseverance and, you know, drip, right? The drip system. Like if you ask people as many times as possible, eventually they'll make their way to you. And for me, I think it's just beaming my light so bright that you attract the right clients to yourself. Not everybody's my ideal client and I'm not everybody's, you know, ideal advisor. So it's just making sure that I'm who I am and I'm attracting the right person for me. So, so once again, uh, you, you said several things, so I kind of want to rear back and, and address a few of them. You know, in, in a previous podcast episode, I brought up that the average salesperson closes 10% of the sales just because there's a need, want, and desire. We call them order takers, right? And putting it in perspective, because let's face it, the consumer, our perspective clients today, they don't window shop anymore. They've done all of that on Google. So by the time they're talking to the salesperson, they've already bought it in their mind. They just don't know from who yet, right? And then a well-trained salesperson, you know, the salespeople that have that have learned the Tom Hopkins porcupine clothes and stuff like that, they close 30% as a closing ratio. We call them order makers, putting that in perspective. That means they're giving 70% of their prospective clients over to their competition. My personal closing ratio is 88%. That means I give 12% of the people I don't want to do business with mm -hmm. to my, my competition. Now, our, our students, our students, their closing ratios range anywhere from 45 to 95%. I have one student who, when she left our class, she didn't lose, she didn't lose an order for the first six months in sales. She had a 100% closing ratio. Insane, this woman was a machine. So back to my question. You are probably in one of the most difficult sales arenas that exist because your, your, your product makes, it, makes forces people to, to really look at their mortality right? It really shouldn't be called life insurance. It really should be called death insurance, right? It's actually called income insurance. It there should be called income go. insurance. There you go. Absolutely. That's what I call it. <laughs> there, good, good. Yeah. So, so, you know, for me, I sell air, right? I sell success and, and we have a 98% success rate with our clients. So we sell air. It's an intangible product. Yours is an intangible product until after the client passes, then it becomes tangible. So, so you brought up uh, ghosting and objections and, and everything like that. You know, the name of the show is Sell Without Selling. Yeah. And, and 
and yeah. for me, selling without selling is a culmination of a lot of things. So let's talk about your sales journey since, since you brought that up. Well, let me tell you, you know, what I sell is peace of mind. Yeah. So, you know, it it's is intangible. a tangible product. Yeah. <laughs> it is tangible because, you know, when people walk out of the office, it's, it's a sense of relief. Mm -hmm. So that's what I sell. I, send, I, send, I sell a sense of security which is right. air, but it's not, it's, you know, it's, you, you can't put a price on that. So, mm -hmm. um, but my job is to make it that it is something that want people would want to have is that sense of relief or peace of mind that knowing that no matter what, that their family is taken care of mm -hmm. and that they're taken care of in the future as well for their future retirement. And then, and I always talk to them about taking care of themselves at their, their future self, right? Mm -hmm. Is it's you know in retirement that's us when we're older, but um, back to your question about grit and perseverance. Not everybody's ready. You're right. I'm in a, a tough, and in the it's tough in the sense that nobody wants to talk about the future and like all the gritty things that that could happen. Um, they definitely want to talk about success. You know, success is a fun, sexy subject. I don't think life insurance or financial planning is is sexy, but we have to talk about it. So it's how do I make it accessible for people to want to have those conversations? How do I make that sense of peace of mind or that sense of security sexy and attractive so that people would want to talk about it? Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and I'd like to talk to that point for a second. When, when we have conversations with people about success, to them, it isn't sexy because it forces them to open up their closet doors and look oh. at their demons. You know, all the goals that they abandoned, all the hopes and dreams that they've walked away from, how many times they've quit on themselves, how many trainings they've gone to, and I'll say in air quotes, it didn't work, right? When reality is, it forces them to face, I didn't work it. Right. Yeah. So it oh, is a very, interesting. it's a very uncomfortable conversation for people to have because there's a lot of tough questions in there. If success is easy and it is, if success is easy, then what about me struggles to accomplish it? Yeah. And that's where the money is. Right. right. And, and the money, the money, the ability to become successful is in the answers to those questions. So yes, as far as life insurance goes, as far as financial planning goes, there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of peace, there's a lot of possibility, there's a lot of relief, there's a lot of security, and yet it still forces people to face the inevitable. It also... It also, I think, presents another obstacle for people, and that is for them to face their self-worth, you know, yeah. because, because they, they, they take a look at the investment and, you know, it's nothing for them to go out and spend $8 on a cup of coffee. It's nothing for them to order out and spend $100 on a meal. It's nothing for them to spend, spend, spend. But when it comes to investing, especially in themselves, that creates a whole nother demon. And the reason why I want to have this conversation with you is because, as you said, there's always going to be objections, right? There's always going to be ghosting. And what happens is as a sales professional, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, we get to learn what we did that worked and learn what we did that didn't work to become even better and move on. And so many, so many take that rejection into their neurology and they take it professionally and personally. And then the itty bitty shitty committee triggers, right? The bully in the brain starts beating them up, which then beats them down, which then prevents them from moving forward. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, because I know Years ago, you and I have had conversations with rejection and everything like that. How did you overcome what that did to you emotionally? Well, I think I think as uh, the, one of the things that I've worked on myself for this, you know, fifteen over the last fifteen years is being kinder to myself. You know, that mm. positive self talk, 
um, because the, the world is tough enough. I mean, I was really tough on myself and that actually helped me for a long time that served me, you know, that, that internal voice of, you know, do more, be more and all that. But then I had a shift, um, you know, and, and I said, okay, now I need, to, and I need to be nicer and kinder to myself. Um, and, but definitely it was tough in the beginning, you get rejections. And as I said, you know, you don't know that it's not personal in the beginning, especially people in our career, they're usually reaching out to their friends and family and they're, they're not seeing them in that light, um, as a finance, they're not seeing them as an advisor. Luckily for me, in any industry. Yeah, they, they, they don't see you as the expert when you're new at something. Uh, so you have to overcome that. And then over time, you know, it goes away. But I think definitely knowing, I, I think for me, it was having that model of my mom for so many years, just having that grid and like that stick to itiveness and making a committed decision to succeed. Um, I think that having that role model in my life really helped me in my business now because I, I don't know any other way than to be strong and to persevere because that's that's the model of behavior that I learned and that's the model of behavior that I show my daughter every day so it's a it's an interesting uh time but I definitely think um working on your self-image it, it really helps a lot in the, that working on your self-image is not just what you look like on the outside it's self-image of what you're telling yourself uh, on the inside each and every day because we're with us, you know, 24 seven with our subconscious mind, we're, we're, we're in it. So um, it's definitely retraining our brain on what we're saying to ourselves each and every day. And now I don't, I went and I don't, if somebody goes to, or, or somebody says, no, I'm not interested. It's like, okay, you know, that's their loss, not mine. You know, I was there to, to be of service, but if they're not ready for my service, there's nothing I can do about that. So I just have to move on to the next person. And I think one of the secrets to success is just getting comfortable with the no's and having fun with them and say, okay, no, okay, next, you know, like just move on because you can't dwell on it. You can't take, take it too personal or else you're, it's, they don't, they move on, you know, they don't care. It's, it's only you care. So you have to just move on just as fast as, as they do, right. As they as a potential client that didn't become the potential client at that time, mm -hmm. um, you just move on to the next thing. And no, no, doesn't mean no all the time. It just means that, well, let, let's put a disclaimer there. No does mean no, right? Yes. It just, it just for in, in a buying and a selling encounter, it could mean you haven't convinced me yet. I don't have the information I need yet. You're not stepping into my map of reality and speaking into my listening. You haven't connected your product, service, or solution to my need, want, and desire. See, the, the, the objections of time and money are surface level objections. We as solution providers, because that's what business owners, entrepreneurs, and sales professionals are, we as solution right. providers, we are incapable of solving a surface level problem. You can't do it because you know the, the objection of time and money, that is so surface level, it's really just a polite objection. Right. What we really need to do, and, and this is where self-mastery comes in, this is where mindset comes in, this is where being an advanced communication specialist comes in, what we get to do is utilize very strategic questions to drill down to the root cause, the real objection, the real problem. You know, for me, I sell air, and when I sell air, you know, people say, oh, that, 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 that date doesn't work, or I can't afford that. And what I, what I have the luxury of doing is, oh, if you could afford it, would you do it then? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Cool. My company offers an interest-free payment plan, and you don't have to have it paid off before you take the training. Well, then they, they kind of look at you, and then the neuron pops, right? And they go, oh, well, that date doesn't work. Oh, so if the date did work, would you take it then? Absolutely, cool. I haven't scheduled the next one yet. Here's a four month window of when I was looking to do it. Pick a date in that four month window and we'll build the training around you. Well, now they're on the floor having a grand mal seizure because they fried every <laughs> neuron in their objection, right? And then they finally give faced with, 
look, I, I don't trust myself. You know how many trainings I've taken and, and, and they've never worked. That's a real objection for me. And I can answer that objection because 90% of the speakers and trainers out there, they train to the conscious mind. When the right. conscious mind gets trained, it can only retain five to 10% of the information. I speak and train to the unconscious mind. So the retention is over 60, 70, 80% then that's where shift happens. That's why we have a 98% success rate with our students. Now, I understand with commodity products like insurance and financial advising and stuff like that, you don't have that flexibility. Mm -hmm. However, there's still other strategies by mastering linguistics to still get to the root cause, mm -hmm. right? Reality is people object and they don't even know why because we live in such a polite society right? So working on your mindset mastery, working on self mastery is absolutely important because there comes a point where you're faced with the realization or the admittance that you truly are the expert in your field. And there, there are competition because let's face it, out in Southern California, financial planners, life insurance, they're kind of like 7-Elevens. There's one on every corner, right? Yeah. And reality is there, there comes a point where you have to ask yourself, am I really the best of the best? Is my competition better than me or am I better than them? And that comes from self-mastery, right? Mm -hmm. That comes from the perseverance, the grit, yeah. So, so Monica, the one thing that I do know is through your entire journey of success, you have had an amazing man supporting you through this, your husband, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Yes. There are a lot of women out there whose family, spouses, significant others, and same with men whose significant others and spouses don't believe in what they do, don't support them in what they do. How... How has your husband's support for you really impacted your journey? I think he just lets me be who I am and lets me, you know, not that he lets me, but he loves who I am and loves, you know, that I am driven and that I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm always hungry. It's like, let's <laughs> brown this, right? Um, so I think that that he's just unconditionally supportive of, you know, any idea and you know, it's not easy because I, I work a lot and we have two, two kids. Um, and, you know, I, I do my best to be a good wife and a good mother to my children and still run my practice to the full capacity that I'm able to. Um, so it's a lot of communication. I think that's the key is communicating on a consistent basis. But for, for me, I think it's his unconditional support and knowing that I can take a risk, like he never questions whenever I take a risk or I make a decision. It's I make a decision. This is what we're going to do. And he actually dreams bigger than me a lot of times. And I, and I'm, and I'm really happy about that because he, you know, he thinks of things bigger than me sometimes. And, and then I, I think, oh, that's a good idea, you know, and we, and we can work towards it. Um, yeah. And so he dreams bigger. So that kind of helps me um, work or, you know, think outside of where I'm, you know, I'm in my box. And so he kind of pushes me out of it in a, in a way, but, but definitely I think it's important to have that supporting spouse that doesn't limit, you know, doesn't limit my dreams or doesn't, you know, is very fully supportive. And um, he helps a lot with, you know, like just picking up the kids from school or if I need to work early and I need, you know, I need help. It's just always, you need that and that unconditional support. Um, and when things are tough, you know, he knows. And when things are good, then, you know, it's there. It's important to have that support. Good, good. Yeah. So let's open up that rabbit hole and let's yeah. talk about being a driven parent and a driven professional and how you have found harmony in juggling your kids' education with the stay-at-home orders as well as building your practice because if memory serves me properly a little birdie told me you're getting ready to uh, launch a new brand and and your independent practice is that accurate yes that's accurate which and is a huge move for you it is a huge move yes i um 
you know, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. I, um, yeah. I think when I met you, Stacey, I had my, I had just had my son and I was really broken about being a very successful, I mean, I was high level executive at my firm and I was in management at that time. And I was really broken about how to succeed in my career and be a good mother to my son. And it was, a, you know, and that's why I went to that training because I needed some congruency. I needed to know how I could be successful at both things. And just like you said, you know, I went to that training and I learned some things and it was helpful. But then at the end, I was still broke, <laughs> still broken. Um, I still didn't know how to how to do. I mean, and, and the thing is that I was doing both successfully, but I couldn't see it because my expectations were high. Right. So I thought, you know, I, I, I couldn't merge the two, even though I was doing a great job, I wasn't giving myself enough credit. Um, so what I learned is just to ask for help. Um, I do have amazing kids and they are super polite and they say please and thank you and they're very caring for one another and they model I think a lot of our behavior at home so I really can't say anything bad I mean obviously they're my children but I, you know most people say that about them so it, it, it's, it's nice to know because I think sometimes as a working mom you wonder oh you know it would it be better if I wasn't so driven in my career but I think they they thrive in it. They're happy to be a part of it. They don't know any different. My kids don't know any different than their mom that works a lot or, or works that, that, you know, mom, they come to the office. This is their second home. You know, they're part of it. So um, they, um, I do something called the Monica Minute on my Facebook and mm -hmm. uh, it's every Wednesday. And one Wednesday they were at the office um, and my daughter said, oh, I'll do the Monica minute this week <laughs> in a Colette minute, you know, and she was such a natural, like it was like no fear, you know, and so I thought that was really cool that, you know, they're part of what we're building together and they know that this is something that they'll have for a long time. So it's a, um, it's a great, it's a great experience, but um, it wasn't an easy journey to merge the two. Let me tell you, I think, I, I think a lot of women uh, struggle with that and still continue. And I mean, I'm not perfect. I still struggle, struggle with it. You know, when I have to do, I got home late last night and then this morning I realized, oh my God, the homework is due for kindergarten, you know, and we have to wake up extra early to get it done. I mean, we still have those issues every day. Mm -hmm. um, of balancing of, you know, my focus too much on my career or my focus too much on my kids, which I don't think you could ever focus enough on your kids. Um, but definitely, um, it's a constant, uh, constant, just a con it's just constant, you're constantly doing something. Um, but it, I just have to enjoy it. And I'm very focused, like when I'm at work, I'm at work, and I'm focused on that. And when I'm at home, I'm at home, and I'm focused on them. And sometimes they don't, kids don't need a lot of time. They just need focus time. So sometimes I'll set a timer and I'll say, okay, you know, for the next 30 minutes, I can cuddle with you and we can like do whatever you want to do. So we can draw or we can do a craft or whatever it is, but they, and then we talk and then I say, okay, you know, mommy's really tired right now. I need 20 minutes. Can I go upstairs and, and rest for 20 minutes? And then I'll come down and play with you. And they're like, okay. So then I go and I set a timer and, or they set a timer. And then, you know, oh, 20 minutes is up. But then, then I have to like step into that role of mom. So it's not, I'm definitely not perfect, but we've, we've, we're figuring it out as we go along. No, I love that. You know, one of the biggest struggles I see as a success strategist and as someone that, that, that helps people facilitate the success in their life is the incongruency. Part of me wants to be the most successful business person and part of me wants to be the best parent ever or the best spouse or, you know, whatever that other side is and the, the struggle, the internal turmoil and how they find harmony. It, it's an amazing journey to, for, for an entrepreneur to realize both sides really want the same thing. And when they, they have that internal shift, that internal realization that the incongruency was really just a fallacy yeah. and that both sides are really pursuing the same goal, whatever that is, the greater goal for, for themselves, it, success becomes inevitable then. It's, it, yeah. it's, it's, it's amazing to really watch. Yeah. Yeah. I think my life is, I mean, you know, people talk about balance you know, they're like, oh, life, work, balance. And I'm like, it's not really about balance. It's about integration. 
-hmm. you know, they're just completely together. It's not one or the other. It's like, how do we merge the two? And I'm very blessed, you know, to be able to do that, um, to, to merge the two. And, um, and, and sometimes the kids, you know, they're, they understand, they're like, oh, who's that? You know, they love, we get a lot of Christmas cards at Christmas for my clients and they have pictures and they, so they, they open the Christmas card and they're like, how come so many people send us Christmas cards? And I'm like, well, mommy, you know, mommy makes an impact in these people's lives. And so, you know, this is important that I'm, you know, I'm part of their family too. And so then, um, they understand that. And before COVID, we would go to a lot of birthday parties. And so they're like, who is this? Oh, it's mommy's client. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. So scientifically speaking, uh, people need to stop pursuing balance because, yeah. because the unconscious mind takes balance very literally, 50-50. And if you're at... 10 hours and one second in work and nine hours and 59 seconds at home. The unconscious mind views that as out of balance and it won't be happy because you said you want work-life balance. Look for the work-life harmony. Seek yeah. out the work-life integration because when, when you harmonize things, 5149 is okay. 70 30s okay because whatever's going on then you're finding the flow you're finding the harmony right yeah i totally agree with you so networking you know yeah. it's funny after i met you i realized how many people we had both known for so long because we were both networking massively for our businesses just in different areas uh -huh. right so how has networking helped you grow your business and your success? You know, I am a natural networker. I mean, it's just natural to me. I don't know if it was like ingrained as a kid. As I said, you know, I had the mom that sold, you know, everything. <laughs> um, and then my, then my mom remarried and, you know, my dad was in a social club. And so we would go to a lot of events with a lot of adults and um, go to a lot of uh, Shriner events. And so I don't know if that I learned that when I was a kid going to these events, but um, I really love to connect with people and I love to be um, connecting people. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, who do you know that does this? And I'm like, oh, I know that person. And then I'm like, oh, I know these three people. And, and then I always, you know, send the, let's say somebody needs a plumber or I don't know, something. So then I send them the referral and then I make sure that I send the plumber the referral and say, oh, this is the person that, you know, needs your help. And I go based on like geographic area or maybe personality type. Like, like I think this person would be a good fit with this person. So I'm always creating that integration. I probably made people millions of dollars, you know, like where I referred them and then they make money. And so, um, so I do it on a consistent basis, but I do it really genuinely from my heart like I just want to I, I always tell my clients if your business grows then that's good for me you know like I grow you grow I grow so I always want to make sure that their businesses are growing and they're thriving um so I I did a, a lot of networking when I started my business I remember I was I was in my mid-20s yeah. I didn't know everybody that I knew probably was didn't have any money so I had to network up and network with people that were older than me that were really thinking about planning for the future or were really going to be putting away more money for retirement. So I had to get really good at networking and connecting people. Um, and so that's that's how I, I did it. But I did it very organically. Like I would go to different networking events, mm -hmm. get the business card, you know, do the follow up. I think I have people that I've met like 10 years ago and I have them on this email marketing system. And, you know, the, I still get appointments from somebody that I met 10 years ago at a networking yeah. event, but they feel connected to me because I've had that consistent follow-up for a long, long time. Um, so I think that's, that not only is it just going to an event and meeting the person at one time, but it's like, how do you follow up on a consistent basis? And for me, it's just making it automatic or, yeah. you know, so that it just happens and I don't aut automating it right yeah. so that it happens on, on a normal basis uh, consistently you know um <clears throat> about I guess it was like four episodes ago give or take uh maybe six I did an episode on uh when 
I don't remember what I named it, but it had something to do with uh, when obstacles appear during your journey for success. And, and I talked about, you know, what I'm going through with my mother and how January 2nd, I had to call 911 because she couldn't breathe. And when they got her to the hospital, they found a mass in her, in her lung. Well, my mom's partner has a brain injury. So my mom's the caregiver for, for her partner. And so we have, we, we had to temporarily move them in with us. And while they're staying with us, you know, I, I work a little bit at home, but a lot in my office. And it, the, the work I do at home is, you know, when I've got early morning phone calls, I'm not going to get up any earlier than what I do. And I'm not going to change my routine because I have a very specific morning routine. So uh, I'll take my phone calls from home. And then, you know, Zooms and, and everything like that happens in the office. So one day I hung up the phone and this was like after a marathon of like 10 phone calls back to back. And now, now keep in mind, I haven't lived with my mother since I was 16 years old. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, five adults in the house, my mom and her partner, and then Mary Lou and I, and then our adult child who's going to Cal State Fullerton. <laughs> my mom looks at me and she goes, you know what, I have to laugh. And I'm like, about what? And she said, your entire journey through school, every report card we got, the teachers would always mark on there, we can't shut her up. <laughs> and, and my mom goes, and now you get paid to not shut up. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, that natural networking thing, I'm, a, I'm an introvert. I'm an introvert by nature, through and through. I am the shyest person that walks into a room. However, yeah. it's a phenomenal networking strategy for me, right? And you're more of an extrovert. You kind of like flutter all over the room. Oh, totally. Uh -huh. and, and that is a phenomenal strategy for you. As a matter of fact, one day we'll do another interview and we'll talk about the introvert strategy and the extrovert strategy. Yeah. So as far as networking goes, what has, what, what's the best networking tip that you can give our listeners? Because let's face it, Networking today is a heck of a lot different than networking, you know, back when we could do live events and stuff like that. So what's the best tip you can give someone as to how to stay connected, how to connect? I think, uh, I think it's, a, you know, they talk about like, I guess it's being of service first and listening to pe what people are looking for. So when mm -hmm. I meet somebody at a network event, I really want to know, you know, why are they there, right? They're, everybody's there to look for something. So whether it be new business, most of the time it's business. So I really want to understand like who's their ideal client. And then that way, if they're very specific about who their ideal client is, then it helps me look in my Rolodex in my brain of like, oh, well, so-and-so that would be the perfect client for that. You know, that would be, you would be the perfect person for this client because you have A, B, and C um, and they are looking for A, B, and C. And so I think that's where my skill set of like being a good listener and asking all of the good questions um, translates into networking uh, because I'm, I'm there to just do a fact finder, like figure out, okay, what is this person about? What's important to them? What is their value system? And then who are they looking for that would match that same value system? Um, because I think a lot of times when I've gone to networking events, if somebody is there to pitch you a product, like I am blah, 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 and I'm selling this, they're not really listening listening to what I have to say, or they're not really understanding, they're not there to listen to me, they're there to tell me about themselves. Um, and I think that's very off put -ish, but I think when you're a good listener, um, then, then you can, you're able to connect with people a lot better, and then you're able to connect people to them or to each other a lot better. Um, and so I think for me, it's been solidifying relationships. I have a very tight, I mean, right now with COVID, my network's been very tight. I know a ton of people, but I have my core group of women that I, you know, trust wholeheartedly. And so we're all, we're kind of working as a team together to try to find each other clients. We're not a networking group or we're not officially anything. We're just a group of girlfriends that genuinely want each other's businesses to grow. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the core thing. And of course we all have clients and I'm always helping my clients 
um, also connect to other people that I think could generate business for them because I, I'm, I have a vested interest in my client's success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I, I, I want to take a right turn in our conversation right now. And, and I'm curious because I know that you've invested very heavily in yourself for your success as I have. So how important has coaching and mentorship been to you in your journey for success? Oh, I think it's everything, everything. I mean, it's so important to invest in yourself and on a consistent basis. And some, you know, you go, you get exposed to a coach, you learn something, then, you know, you take it from there and then you maybe find another coach because sometimes you outgrow your coach and that's pretty normal. Or sometimes, you know, their mindset isn't uh, the right one or the sim similar to yours. Um, so I'm very picky about who I work with because I think it's important to say, I want a coach that says, you know, I have these big dreams and I want to do all these things. And I want to make sure that the coach that I'm working with is, is also on board with like saying that's possible. Because a lot of times, you know, if the, if a coach doesn't see it for themselves, then, then they kind of minimize it for you in that, in that sense, especially when it comes to life work balance or, or for me, it's life work harmony. Mm -hmm. Um, they, um, they're like, well, you know, I, I worked with a coach once and she said, well, why is that goal important? You know, your kids are little, shouldn't you be spending more time with your kids? Ouch. And, and right. I, I, <laughs> I, and I said, you know, and I totally took it like, okay, you know, she's really watching out for me as a person thinking, you know, you're not going to have regrets, um, later when you're older and your kids are grown and you missed out on all these, you know, things, but but as a working mom, that's not what I wanted to hear. And then, um, and so, so I said, you know, I, I appreciate that you want to care for me as my future self looking back, you know, mm -hmm. but at the same time, these business goals are really important to me. And then I've had other coaches where I had a male coach that was a business strategy coach. And he said, Monica, after meeting with me for like a couple of times, he said, Monica, I don't really, I'm overwhelmed by the amount of work that you do in a day and I'm overwhelmed by your system. <laughs> so I don't think I'm the right coach for you because you know, like you have way too many things going on. Like he was just used to working with like male executives that they have stay at home wives and you know, they don't have all these other things that they have to take care of. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's, you know, interviewing the right coach and making sure that their mindset is meeting your meeting and matching your mindset. is really important. And also just constantly learning. I mean, I'm, I'm always hungry to learn more about myself and learn how I can be better, do more, you know, do it faster, do it more efficiently, you know, do it uh, better, you know, like whatever it is. I mean, I'm, I'm always reading, I'm always learning and I'm, and then obviously modeling people that you admire, you know, like, okay, I really admire this person. They, they have it together. What are they learning? What are they reading? And then, you know, you know learning from other people, I think it's important. Mm -hmm. I love that answer. You know, I, I have, I have seven coaches and I actually just recently hired an eighth and, and there, there is little to no overlap. Each one focuses on a different area. And for me, you know, some of my coaches I've been with for 10 years, it's, I, I, I would hope the day would come where I would outgrow them because, well, let's just say that I would be a billionaire by then. Right. And then, and then uh, some of the coaches, like I, I personally had a coach that, that told me, I don't know how you do everything you do. And I said, and you just told me that I've outgrown you. And she goes, I think you're right, right? And, and this actually, I love that you brought this up because this, this reminds me of a conversation I just recently had with someone and it, it fired me up so much that I actually did a podcast episode on it. And, and that is, if you can't help them, don't, right? And because there, there's a terminology called smoking a client and we all have product services and solutions and they fill very specific needs, wants and desires. And if you can't see your product, service, and solution solving someone's need, want, and desire, then stop because it, it's no longer ecological for you to move in with the buy, sell, and counter. It's time to back up and, and just cease and desist because there's plenty of other clients who need your product and there's better solutions there that fulfill it. If you 
can't see actualizing the long-term, short-term success for a client back off. You have no business making that sale. Mm-hmm. I'm off my soapbox because it really made me angry when after my conversation with that person because they had been smoked for a year. Oh, you know, yeah. The, the coach that, that they're working with does, told them flat out, I don't even believe in what you do, but I'm going to help you anyway. How can they help them? <laughs> so yeah. so uh, you, you brought up uh, development, personal and professional development. How has that helped your journey for success? Because being someone who's in the field of personal and professional development, people don't invest in themselves enough. They, they really don't realize that the brain that created today is incapable of creating a different tomorrow. And they, re- they don't realize that what you feed grows and what you starve dies. They just continue to attempt to change their outcomes and their situations with the same knowledge, tools, skill sets, mindset that they have. So how has personal and professional development assisted you in your success journey? Oh, I think it has helped me a lot because it's, their mindset is everything when it comes to, to success. You know, it's making committed decisions, right? And um, one of the things, making, seeing other people succeed that are, you know, I have role models in my industry that are women, that are mothers and that are being successful um, and then learning from them. And they said, okay, where, where do I start? You know? And so it's who you hang out with too. So, you know, I, I, I hang out with very successful women and, and I, and then I see, okay, they're balancing it. Okay. What are you learning and how can we support each other? Um, that, that only goes so far at the end of the day, you know, it's I'm 24 seven with me. So I really had to invest in myself and I've never been, been shy about investing in myself because I'm going to be with me for the, for the rest of my life. <laughs> so I gotta, I gotta love myself and yeah. I gotta continue to grow so that I can have that peace and that harmony that I really want. Um, and so I, I usually pick a subject uh, that I want to work on. So I started with mindset uh, about two years ago and then um to, I guess it was like two years ago, I started with a mindset and, you know, like the growth mindset. And then I started with, you know, um, just overall mindset. And then, um, and then now it's like self-image, right? The, how to have, because I identified that, you know, I was really hard on myself and I didn't want to live the rest of my life being mean to myself. Mm-hmm. And because th- that was working because it was giving me the high success results that I wanted, but it wasn't a fun way to achieve results. I wanted to do it in a kinder way because I, I'm not a mean mother to my children. I, I am always positively praising them. And, and I know that, you know, giving them positive feedback and praise is always going to get me better results, right? My dad always says you get more results with honey than you do with vinegar. Um, But then I realized that I was treating everybody with honey and I was pretty much drinking vinegar. And so I I had to shift that um, for myself. And so every year I say, okay, like I've mastered that. Okay, now can I go to the next thing? And so I'm constantly working on myself because I'm always evolving and growing. Um, but I think it's been a, it's, it's a journey. And, you know, when we met, uh, you know, was it like, I don't even know, I think it was like 10 years ago. Um, we, I mean, wow. that was the beginning of my journey. I think that was yeah. one of the first uh, courses that I took on personal development and yeah. it really woke me up to yeah. the realization. So it was 12 years ago and, yeah. uh, and, and for, for me, you know, I remember early nineties uh, sitting in a gym room seminar. It was actually uh, Jim Rohn, Bob Proctor, and Brian Tracy. It was like the trifecta, the godfathers of, of personal and professional development. And Jim had come out on stage and said, you really need to be investing 30% back into yourself every year. And I've taken that equation and applied it to my personal and professional development. And I have to tell you, it has paid me back tenfold for every dollar I put into myself strategically. You know, this isn't a spray and pray. This is a very strategic approach, but for every dollar I put back in myself, I make 10. So it's been a phenomenal journey. So welcome to the signature question of the show, Monica. What is selling without selling mean to you? Ooh, 
I think selling without selling is just having something that people really desire, you know, like, as I said, beaming your light so bright that people are like, what is she doing? And how can I be a part of it? And I realized that my light is really bright and, and people want to be a part of it. Um, so now I have to watch who I choose to be a part of it. But selling without selling is, is that being a magnet for what you want um, and beaming so bright that people want to know, okay, what is she doing? And how can I be a part of it? That's and what I think. That is. I love that answer. Thank you. And the only way that it happens is to like, love and trust yourself enough to, to be that beacon, right? Yes. So welcome to the random round. See, I believe that success leaves clues. And yeah. I like to ask questions to our success guests so that our listeners can extract golden nuggets and apply what resonates with them to their life. So the first question I'm gonna ask you, I pretty much know the answer. And I love watching it on a continual basis on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So what is your morning routine like? Oh my goodness. Um, so self-care is part of self-image. Mm -hmm. um, so I made a commitment to myself. I wake up at 440 in the morning. I go to the gym for 45 minutes. Those are the best. That's the best hour of my day in the sense that when I'm doing the gym workout, I'm not thinking about all the other things that I need to do. I'm just thinking about how can I get through this workout? And you know, at 440 in the morning, when I wake up and I get out the door um, before five, it's the first win of my day. When I walk out of the door and that cold, you know, wind that hits my face, yeah. I got the day I won. You know, I'm like, I'm out of the house and I won. So I go at five, I work out for 45 minutes. I get home. I actually study for an hour. So I do my book, you know, cause my kids don't wake up till seven. So from six to 645, I'll listen to an audio or I'll watch a video. I, I love Bob Proctor. I love, you know, um, I, whatever, uh, uh, James Clear, you know, the habits book, whatever, is, whatever I'm into or whatever I'm focused on at the time, I either do an audio book while I'm making breakfast for my kids, I'm packing their lunches and all that stuff. Then, you know, at seven o'clock they wake up and then it's mommy time and, you know, I get them ready for school and make sure they're, they, we eat breakfast together every day because, you know, I don't eat lunch with them and sometimes dinner I get home late. So I definitely make them like a special breakfast or whatever it is. I just get them fed. <laughs> it doesn't have to be fancy. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then, you know, we're off to school and then I, you know, or, or I get myself ready and then we're off to school. And, you know, right now I just, I made a committed decision to put them in private school uh, because after COVID we were doing a uh, a distance learning, you know, when everything shut down. Um, but I think for their mental health, um, I had to step into myself as my goal achieved and, you know, made a committed decision to, to put them in private school. And that was a really a big goal of mine that I had, that I wanted them to go to a, 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 a private school. And um, I, I, you know, I had all the other excuses of why, you know, it's expensive and blah, blah, blah. But we just did it. And it was like one of the best decisions we've made. And so we have our routine back. But during COVID, obviously, we didn't. So that was a tough one. <laughs> nice. But um, nice. so then I get off to school. And then, you know, I get to the office, like plan out my you know, what we're going to do. And then my team gets here at 1030 in the morning. So I have that an hour and a half buffer that I can have some quiet thinking time to figure out what we need to get done. And then the rest of the day just goes. Yeah, I love it. So my last random round question is what's your favorite word and why? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> I would say my favorite word is mindset um, because it's everything begins and starts with that. You know, yeah. you can have a good day or a bad day and it's just in your mind and what you decide for that to be for you. Yeah. Um, I think that's been like the key to everything for me. It's like understanding that I set the tone. I, I understand that I set the tone and I set the temperature in every room that I walk into and at home too, I'm the leader of my household. So when I walk in and, you know, I need to make sure that I'm in the right mental space because I need to provide that warmth um, for my family. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I love both of your answers and, and I have to tell you, Monica, I have loved 
talking with you today. It's been phenomenal. So if our guests would like to reach out to you or connect with you or follow you, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Um, they could send me an email, which I'm sure you'll post it on there. That's a good way to get a hold of me, or they can follow me on my, you know, my Facebook, um, which is, you know, my Facebook or my Instagram. I mean, I'm definitely a social media person, and I, I love to be a part of that. Um, but definitely email or phone is whatever. It doesn't matter. Just reach out, and I'll be happy to help. Okay. So can you leave your so? Can you give us right now your social media? Uh, handles as well as your email address and any phone number so that uh, sure. Seth can include so my, it in the show notes. Yeah, so it's 714-478-2592. That's my cell phone number. My email address is merangle um, at ft.newyorklife.com. And my uh, social media, just at Facebook, it's Monica Escobar Rangel. And on uh, Instagram, it's Monica, a peace of mind creator. And so like, that's, that's what the handles are. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you. I've seriously had a phenomenal time chatting with you today. Your success is important to me. And it's also important to me to make sure that these episodes are valuable to you. I would love for you to do a few things right now. I'd love for you to hop over to Instagram and follow us at Pivot Point Advantage. That's hop over to Instagram and follow us at Pivot Point Advantage. Second, I'd love it if you'd head over to Facebook and join our Sell Without Selling community. That's head over to Facebook and join our Sell Without Selling community. We have an immense amount of interaction on both platforms. We also share different information on both platforms. So we look forward to seeing you there. Last and definitely not least, I love to chat with you, give feedback on the episodes, and find out any topics that you're interested in to help make this podcast more powerful and helpful to you achieving the success you've always dreamed of, desired, and deserved. Head over to pivotpointadvantage.com slash talk to Stacy. That's pivotpointadvantage.com slash talk to Stacy. Let's get a 15-minute call on the schedule. I look forward to getting to know you. Always remember this, choice is a powerful thing and suffering is always optional. Get out of your way so that you can get on your way so you can finally have your way. Thanks so much for listening and I look forward to talking with you soon. Whether it's mastering your mindset, communication or success, we have more ways to keep you on your journey to greatness. Be sure to visit us at pivotpointadvantage.com for exclusive online training programs, success specific courses and more ways to connect to Stacy directly to help you achieve the financial success you've always desired, dreamed and deserved. That's all available on pivotpointadvantage.com.